just want to guide your thoughts toward the one who makes it well. I just want you to celebrate for a moment. Give praise to God for his goodness. His grace and mercy transcend circumstances. No matter what's going on, whether it's illness, relational disharmony, some sort of work or financial crisis, the good news is that when we are connected with Jesus, it is well. He gives us the peace that passes all understanding. He is with us as we walk through the valley of the shadows of life and death. And we don't have to fear any evil because he is with us. Father, we are so thankful for the victory that we have in you. Lord, today as we turn our attention to that baby lying in a manger, I pray that you would give us a vision for the journey for the purpose of his journey and the gifts of life and peace that he brings. It's in the strong name of Jesus, I pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. You may be seated. I want to start uh, by asking a question of you. Do, do any of you have uh, faith? You know, as a matter of fact, I, I tell my guys at home that I can't listen to everybody speaking at one time, but we're, I, I want to do this today. If you have a favorite Christmas movie, all right, does everybody know a favorite? I, I just want you to call it out, all right, on three. Everybody's going to call out their favorite Christmas movie, and we'll see if I can discern the best ones. One, two, three. Okay, I heard Elf a few times. Uh, has anyone seen their favorite Christmas movie? And raise your hand. Uh, more than five times. Raise your hand. More than ten times? More than fifteen times? Twenty times? Wow. Fifty times. I have a friend who... Did somebody say yes on the fifty? I, I have a friend who uh, at Christmas each year, I think, he still does this... He will announce when uh, the Christmas story is being played, and he plays it for 24 hours a day. He loops it through on his television all day until it's over. All right, that's anyway, I, I haven't gotten to that point. But why do we why do we watch those stories over and over and over again? What is it about those stories that draw us in? Why do kids at night want to read the same storybook over and over and over again? The answer is there, there's some level of familiarity and security in a story that we know well. And in a story that turns out in an inspiring way. And we, we all gravitate toward repeating that refrain, I think, because life can be challenging, and it doesn't always feel well, but we know in those stories that it ends well. And in those stories, it is typically well with our souls. We've been going through... Uh, in, in this series, we've been talking about the birthday boy, Jesus, and the fact that Mary and Joseph, we hypothesize, told Jesus these stories of his birth over and over again. They, they talked about the encounters, and, and we're, we're looking at what I believe would be three of his favorite encounters that I anticipate the Christ child asking Mary and Joseph to tell him those stories over and over again. Last week, we looked at the encounter with Simeon. Simeon was an older man who spent his life worshiping God, and 
because of his intimate connection with our creator, God told him that before he died, he would see the consolation of Israel. That means that Simeon believed that he would see the messianic son of God before he died. And on that day when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus into the temple to be consecrated according to the law, there was Simeon to greet him. And he took him in his arms and he knew certainly that he was holding the son of God. Now, the encounter that we're going to look at today is one that I think Jesus loved hearing about. I certainly do. But it occurred actually on the night of his birth. And it's told in the traditional Christmas story. So if you have your Bibles and want to follow along today, I'm going to be reading from Luke chapter 2. Luke is the one that gives us the story of the night that Jesus was born. And uh, I'm, I'm going to break with our uh, tradition here. We generally read from the New International Version, but there's just something about the Christmas story in the King James or the New King James that gives us that familiarity that we love. So I'm reading from Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house and lineage of David. He went to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over or their flock by night, their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly, sorely afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let's now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph, And the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen him. And when they had seen him. They made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told them. Let's pray. Father, I ask that as we study this familiar passage that you would warm our hearts to its truth. Father, that our faith would be elevated and Lord, if, if there are those who are on the outside looking in, feeling like 
they can't connect with their creator. I pray that by your grace and through your spirit, they would be convinced of your love. And all of us, Lord, would embrace this good news as our own. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, Mary and Joseph went to a city that was far removed from their family and friends. They were instructed by the government to go to the town of Joseph's heritage. That would be the town of Bethlehem. And while they were away from family and friends, they had their first child. And the only people who came to celebrate the birth of their child with them were strangers. Think about that. They could have felt like their space was being invaded or they could have felt a profound, lonely emptiness. But there were some strangers whose story of how they got there was just as strange as their faces. Apparently, an angel from God appeared to the shepherds in the field with news about the birth of a child, and then right after that announcement, a choir of angels showed up to celebrate, commemorating the occasion in song. Why those shepherds? Of all the people in town, and we know there were lots of people in Bethlehem because the governor said, go home and register. We also know there are lots of people there because there, were, there was no room for them in the inn. Why the shepherds? Well, the truth is this wasn't a normal group of shepherds. History teaches us that by this time, it, it was extremely rare for shepherds to watch their flocks at night. Why? Because sheep were generally kept in a pen at night. Uh, normally, a group of shepherds would combine their different flocks, they would put them in a pen, and then after night, they would come back to the pen, call their sheep by name, and they would follow them out to the pasture. Jesus talks about that in John chapter 10. He said the sheep would know their shepherd's name and follow them out to pasture. So in the day and age of the birth of Jesus, it was unusual for shepherds to be watching over their flocks at night, much less to live in fields nearby, as the text reveals this group did. So what was going on with them? The, these shepherds lived in a gypsy-type encampment, utilizing a watchtower that the historian Eusebius says was built 1,000 paces outside the city or the town of Bethlehem. And what would happen was at night, a small number of this group of shepherds would ascend the, the stairs to the top of the watchtower while their co-workers slept, and they would watch over those flocks at night. But why were they watching through the night? If everybody else was putting their shepherds in pens, why did this particular group of shepherds work through the night? Well, the answer is these sheep were special. They were very special sheep. Scholars tell us that there was only one flock. Now, when we typically read that story, we say shepherds wa watching or their flocks by night. But that's not what it says. The text says they were watching over their flock by night. One. And scholars tell us that there was only one flock of sheep that received this round-the-clock attention. And, and the flock was comprised of sheep that were to be offered at the temple for sacrifice. These were the sheep that would be going to the temple to be sacrificed. Why were they watched continuously? Because according to the rules of sacrifice, there, there were, they were strict and unbending. Okay, These sheep, to qualify for the temple sacrifice, 
had to be pure and undefiled. They had to be flawless in every way, unblemished. And if they had a single blemish, if there was one single problem with the sheep that were to be offered, then according to the law, the sheep would be rejected, the people offering the sheep would be rejected by God. So the only way to ensure that these sheep were unblemished and therefore acceptable for sacrifice was to watch them 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. These were very special sheep. But remember, the angel didn't come to the sheep. He came to the shepherds. Why that group of shepherds? Well, we would think because they had such an important job, they were really important in the community. If they didn't do their job, then then people couldn't go to the temple and offer sacrifices and be forgiven and celebrate their relation with their creator. We might think that, but the truth is there was absolutely nothing special about these shepherds or their job in the eyes of society, nothing that would catapult them to the top of the list of people that would receive the birth announcement. The truth about these shepherds is that they were firmly, firmly entrenched on the lowest rung of the social ladder precisely because they herded sheep. It didn't matter what kind of sheep. They were rejects. You've heard people say she cusses like a sailor. Well, in this day in Jerusalem, the comment was, he lies like a shepherd. The character of shepherds was in question always, undoubtedly. No one believed shepherds. As a matter of fact, if a shepherd was an eyewitness to a crime, their testimony would not be allowed in the court of law, because he lies like a shepherd. They were always suspect. The character of the shepherd was always suspect. In their culture, they were not to be believed. They were not to be heard. Nobody listened to shepherds. And that's going to be very important as we go through the story. So just just think about it. Instead of being revered for this most important work that these shepherds gave their lives to, they were ostracized. To make matters worse, though their, their lives were about tending the very sheep that would help people get right with God... They never could. They couldn't get right with God. See, there were rules. And the only way to connect with God was to go through what was called a a ritual cleansing. There was a process to enter the temple and the presence of God. And because they lived out in the fields 24-7 giving care for these special sheep, they were unable to attend these ritual cleansings. So they were unclean, perpetually unclean. Now think about it. Their job was to keep the sheep clean, but the the people who kept them clean were perpetually unclean and therefore unforgiven because they couldn't offer sacrifices to God in the temple. Dr. Alfred Edersheim cites rabbinical writings that say, and I quote, the shepherds who kept the sheep for sacrifice were forbidden to sacrifice in the temple. So I want you to think about their conundrum. They couldn't get ceremonially clean, so they couldn't enter the temple. Since they couldn't enter the temple, they couldn't make sacrifices required to be forgiven by God. So these men, because of their work, could not find peace with God. Yet without them, 
and their work, no one would have been able to make an acceptable sacrifice to God in order to find their peace. So it's quite ironic that these shepherds were being failed by the very system they served. The connection they worked for was forbidden to them. Now, parenthetically, I think their conundrum is a perfect illustration for the failure of religion. You know what religion is, right? It's man's effort to get to God. In religion, there are rules that you serve so that you you make yourself acceptable to God. And then maybe, just maybe, there are no guarantees, but maybe, just maybe, if you work hard enough, stick with it, then God will accept you. Maybe. But religion, that idea is inherently flawed. Religion says, try this, and maybe you can get to God, or maybe not. The truth is, in religion, someone is always left out. You can't do enough. You you can't get everything right. Religion always leaves the adherent wondering if their God is pleased by their effort. Have I done enough to satisfy or appease my God? And in this case, the answer for the shepherd was, No, you haven't done enough. The very system is set up to keep you out, you're always going to fall short of the glory of your system. All those shepherds would never do enough to get in. They were doomed. On the outside, looking in, And those in the religion would cross their arms and smugly say, they did it to themselves. This is on them. They chose to be shepherds. They made the choice. Obviously, if they really cared about connecting with God, they would find another job. Obviously, they chose to be left out. But is that always true? When people make choices that create in our eyes an almost impossible path to connect with God, is it always their fault can they just pick themselves up get themselves sorted out and connect with God isn't that religion isn't that what we rail against I think it is Somehow we, we lose sight of the fact that Jesus came for all, to all. And we say, wherever you are, God can reach you. I think that's why the angels came to those shepherds. Because they had put themselves out. Out to pasture, pun intended. 
And yet God sent his angels to say, to you is born. I think just because they were working in a job that kept them locked out, it doesn't mean that they didn't want to be let in. We, we've got to stop assuming that to be true about people. That if they wanted to make a connection with God, they would do something different. You know what the scripture tells us? God has placed eternity in the heart of every man, woman, boy, and girl. And that little splash of eternity is a seed in our hearts that, that makes us want to connect with our Creator. It, it makes us want to be in community, in fellowship with God and those who are connected to God. And it normalizes all of us. Even those people who are working in areas that we think, oh, if, if you really wanted to connect with God, you would get out of that. Let, let me tell you, at Christmas we celebrate that Jesus came to, for those people. The angels announced it, the angel announced it, and the choir sang about it. Here's what God knows and we should acknowledge. The shepherds and those who are typically locked out are normal. They want to know that they matter. They want to know that they're loved. They want to be a part of community. And they were, these shepherds were in a community. It was a community of spiritual misfits, no doubt about it. But they were in community demonstrating that they were just like the rest of us. And by the way, their community believed in God. But you know what their religion told them? God doesn't believe in you. Think about it. What would it be like if we sent the message... You, you believe in God? Well, God doesn't believe in you because of what you do. Because of where you came from. Listen, those shepherds wanted in, but they weren't welcomed because they weren't good enough. And, and maybe, maybe they chose to be shepherds because they believed what society had been telling them all along. Maybe they believed that because of the things they had done in their past, no sacrifice, no cleansing would ever clean them up. Maybe they, as they were growing up, they didn't like school and they didn't perform well in the areas where culture says you, you have to do well if you're going to understand God and connect with Him. Maybe they, they grew up in families where their parents didn't demonstrate love to them when they were young, and so they, they believed that they couldn't be loved. Or maybe, just maybe, they saw through all the religious hypocrisy of the elite. And they believed in God, but they were repulsed by the arrogance of the religious insiders. And so they chose to operate outside. Maybe it was some of all of that. I, I think if we were honest, all of us would choose to admit that there are times where we don't feel worthy of a connection with our Creator. where the scenes that are running through our mind, we, we remember the choices we've made and we think we're disqualified. Maybe it's for some of the same reasons that the shepherd felt that way. 
But here, here's the truth. Whatever it was that caused them to operate on the fringes, they were what they were. They were shepherds living out in the field, out of the mainstream, listen, watching the flock for God, but outside the flock of God. Yet, in a shocking turn of events, this group of loveless leftovers were approached by an angel and given the birth announcement for the Son of God. It was a, a glorious invitation to the birthday boy's first party. Now, understanding who they were, I think that call to the shepherds explodes with significance. What was the message from the angel that night? Look at verses 10 and 11. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Listen, it's good news of great joy that's not just for those on the inside, but it's also good news to those on the outside, those who are outside looking in. What was the news? Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Listen, here's the great news. The Savior is not just for those who get it right. Not just for those who conform to the religious expectations. He, he's not just for those who are ritually clean, for those who are allowed in because they, they conform to the facade of religiosity. What the angel informed them that night was that the cleansing they longed for the cleansing that they needed, and by the way, we all need, was being offered by God without restriction or qualifiers. All you who are weary. All of us. We're included. Those shepherds didn't have to work for it. They didn't have to work to get to God because He came to them. You know what happened that night? Religion was turned upside down and renamed relationship. Now everyone was good enough. How was everyone good enough? Because God said they were. Everyone was good enough because God said they were. Now those who desperately wanted a mulligan, a do-over in life, that they could find forgiveness without one. Now those who knew no love were being pursued by the tender, fierce, relentless love of God. Now because of the gift of Christ, those who were on the outside looking in could come in from the cold and enjoy a meaningful relationship with their Creator. See, because the shepherds, who were, by the way, society's outcasts, because they were at the top of the list, we knew exactly what that first gift of Christmas, the Advent, was all about. It was all about saying, you're loved. You're welcome." God stepped out of eternity and into time, landing in the form of a baby, to say, come to me. It was the announcement of acceptance. The angel announced to the shepherds, unto you, shepherds, to you guys, is born this day a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, 
But it was also an announcement of God's love for the whole world. Why would God come to people who had literally had no influence? To show the depth and breadth of his love. See, for God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That, that was the announcement. That was the essence of the encounter with the shepherds. And so I, I'm convinced that as Mary and Joseph rehearsed that encounter with Jesus, Jesus came to understand his role. As a child, we have hypothesized that he would learn about what he was supposed to do. Yes, through reading the scriptures, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, but also through the teaching of his parents. And I, I think this story in particular helped Jesus understand that he was sent for those who were turned away by religion. He, he came to make a way for all to get in. To welcome all of us. Not just those shepherds. And not just those who had it going on and according to their culture were connected with God. But he came to make a way for the whole world. And that was the essence of the announcement on the night of his birth. And he came to understand it and, and he embraced this, this vision of radical inclusiveness. And as he lived his life, you could see throughout his ministry, that's exactly what he was doing. He, he touched the untouchables. He touched lepers, those who were accursed in society. He gave safe harbor to a woman who was caught in adultery, accepting and protecting her, who by her very actions were, was saying, screaming, I'm out of here, I'm on the outside. He sat down and talked to a Samaritan woman at a well, something no Jewish man would ever do. Why? Because he was saying, I'm coming to accept you just as the shepherds accepted me. See, Jesus' mission was to seek and save the lost. It wasn't to seek and save the acceptable lost. It wasn't to seek and save the lost who vote like me or talk like me or cheer like me. It was to seek and save all the lost. All those who recognize that except for Christ, we are on the outside looking in. He pursued them indiscriminately. Without prejudice for where they had been, what they looked like, or what they had done. And in the process, he destroyed all of the dividing lines that religion seeks to erect and protect. By faith in that child, there are no more lines of division. We are all one in Christ. And so at Christmas, that child was born to us, for us, and he made the way to God. And we no longer have to be outcasts. Isn't that good news? There are no outcasts. And so let's don't cast anybody out.
Here's the good news of Christmas, no matter where you've been, what you've done, where you come from, what your parents did to you or for you. No matter your religious background, no matter your education level, or the size of your bank account. Christ came for you. You could have had all the advantages or none of the advantages. And Christ stepped into this world to say, you matter. That child grew up to be the way that we connect with our Creator. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you on the outside? Doesn't matter how you got there. The reality is we all start there. Or, have you chosen to place your faith in the way to the inside? Have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? I just want you to bow your heads for a moment. And I want you to think through this. Some of you know that you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ. And that's something to celebrate. You should say a prayer of thanksgiving. Celebrating the gift of the Christ child. Now others of you, you're, you're not sure. You think you're on the outside. Let me tell you how, let me tell you about the way inside. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. The answer to moving in, to being connected with your Creator, is placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And there's no work. This isn't religion. There's no work that has to be done. All you have to do is believe. He did all the work. And so if you're not a follower of Jesus, today's the day that you can connect. And just simply tell Him, Father, I... I'm grateful for what you did through Jesus, I believe. And the good news is that spotless, sinless, perfect Lamb of God will lead you to forgiveness. Lord, I pray if there are any in this room that don't know you today, that today would be the day of their connection with you. That they would realize your forgiveness and celebrate the life that Christ came to give. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And we're not quite finished. One more thing about the shepherds. You, you saw what happened, right? Just, just as the angel told them they could go and they would find a baby lying in the manger, that's exactly what happened. They the shepherds who were protecting the lambs that got people to God went to the manger and saw the Lamb of God. Those who kept the sheep spotless saw the spotless, sinless Son of God. What did they do next? Look at verses 17 and 18. Now when they had seen Him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. What did they do when they saw the good news? They did what's natural when we get good news. They told somebody. Remember, these, these were people who weren't allowed to testify in a court of law. There was no credibility for these shepherds. Yet, you know what they did? They overcame their reluctance. They died to themselves and said, this news that a Savior was born for the world is too good to withhold. And so they overcame themselves and spread the truth. 
And it was that ruddy band of ragamuffins that became the first evangelists. Now here's the question. If you have embraced the good news, have you shared it? One of my favorite songs at Christmas time is Go Tell It on the Mountain. And what we're going to do today is we're going to stand up and we're going to sing Go Tell It on the Mountain as a reminder that this good news that God has changed our life is available to all. Let's sing. All right, thank you. You may be seated. I'm going to pray and we're going to head out. But listen, that's the responsibility of all of us who celebrate life within the kingdom of God is to share the way. Go tell it on the mountain. Father, we are so grateful for your goodness and your grace. We're grateful, Lord, that when you first announced the advent, you announced it to those who were on the outside. It's a reminder, Lord, of your heart for each one of us, the message that we matter. And so, Father, I pray that as we live in the reality of that message, we would be faithful to share it. Let us, Lord, share the good news as we celebrate the good news. It's in the strong name.